Hi everyone, we're going to do the steps to muscle contraction today. Now these are going to be quite a few steps. Many of you know if you study the contraction process of skeletal muscle, it, it can be lengthy. There's a lot that takes place when we go to fire a skeletal muscle. Keep in mind a few things really fast as we go through this. Uh, skeletal muscle, of course, is a, our only voluntary muscle, right? It, we, we, we use skeletal muscles consciously and of course uh, we refer to it as, we also refer to it as somatic muscle for that you know, matter. And then keep in mind also that uh, with skeletal muscle we've got a, uh, multiple nuclei and it is considered striated muscle as well. So a few little details there, but we're going to go through the process uh, step by step. The first thing that we're going to start with is basically, you know, we'll draw some of this out, but we're going to start with the arrival of the nerve signal. That's really going to be uh, step one. So here is our skeletal muscle down here. This would be our nerve fiber that would be innervating the skeletal muscle. And again, we're just going to say step one is going to be the arrival of the nerve signal. Okay, because we're going to consciously tell our brain, hey, we want to fire a particular skeletal muscle and that our brain is going to send that nerve signal down to the skeletal muscle. So that's really step one, the arrival of the nerve signal. Okay. Now, I drew this nerve fiber with a bulge at the distal end, right? This is our synaptic knob. And inside the synaptic knob are vesicles. Okay, and all these vesicles are filled with a special chemical. No, it's not a hormone. No, it's not a paracrine or some other chemical. It is a neurotransmitter. Okay, keeping in mind that some neurotransmitters also function as hormones. But what makes this chemical a neurotransmitter? The answer is uh, the fact that it is going to be involved in a synapse. Okay, or it's inside and crossing the synapse, okay? Uh, so that's what makes it a neurotransmitter versus some other chemical. So step one being the arrival of the nerve signal, step two being the release of the neurotransmitter from the vesicle, okay? It's gonna leave the vesicle and of course leave the nerve fiber. So what are we gonna call that? We're gonna call that exocytosis, all right? Because it's basically leaving one cell and heading to another, it's going to float across this gap in the synapse. Okay, that gap, of course, is called the synaptic cleft. And what's it going to do? It's going to bind to receptors, okay, on the skeletal muscle side. Okay, so these are the receptors it's going to bind to, which means it's going to have to be a specific neurotransmitter. For skeletal muscle, that specific neurotransmitter is going to be acetylcholine. Okay, that's going to be our neurotransmitter for skeletal muscle. So acetylcholine is going to specifically be the one that floats across the cleft and binds to these receptors. Now, what's that going to do? That's the next question. So next thing that's going to do is when that ACH, or acetylcholine, binds to the receptor, that's going to trigger the opening of the sodium gates. Okay, that's the first thing that's going to happen. We can kind of draw that out maybe to make that make more sense. But that's going to be the opening uh, here at the sodium gates. I was going to try to draw a uh, picture of that. And I'm not the best drawer in the world, but we'll see what we can do here. But that's really going to draw, uh, open the sodium gates. And that's what's really going to trigger the stimulation to the skeletal muscle. Okay, and we'll kind of go through that. So. Let's take a quick look, uh, look at this first, try to draw this best as we can. This is going to be skeletal muscle at rest, okay? And what we'll notice about it is that sodium is outside the cell. This is where sodium is going to basically be. The abundance of sodium is going to be outside the muscle cell at rest. Potassium will be inside, the abundance again of potassium will be inside the muscle cell at rest, okay? And the question is, well, what puts the sodium outside and puts the potassium inside? And that would be the sodium-potassium pump. So the sodium-potassium pump is 
uh, constantly you know, putting sodium outside or pumping it outside and pumping potassium inside. Okay, It's keeping them in their relative locations. What that is doing as well is giving us a net positive charge outside the muscle cell and giving us a net negative charge inside the skeletal muscle cell. So it will literally measure, it'll measure in millivolts, right? Not in volts like, you know, what we would have for, for lighting in this building, but it would measure in millivolts, okay, a negative charge, okay? So what happens is, again, when ACH binds to these receptors, it's the correct neurotransmitter for the receptor. That's going to trigger the opening of the sodium gate. Sodium is going to flood into the skeletal muscle cell. It actually doesn't like being outside, it likes being inside. So when those gates open, it's gonna flood in. The flooding of the sodium gates, because sodium is a positive charge and the abundance of sodium is going from outside the cell now to the inside, it is going to flip the charge on the skeletal muscle cell. It's going to flip the charge now, okay? to a positive charge inside and a negative charge outside. So that is what we would say uh, occurs when skeletal muscle is in the firing stage, okay? I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit here, but in the firing stage of skeletal muscle, when it fires, it will show not a negative charge anymore, but a positive charge, again, in millivolts, okay? That's one of the the, uh, the key things about that, okay? So keep that in mind. So that's an important phenomenon that is occurring. That's really going to stimulate, like I said, the skeletal muscle fibers is, is the influx of sodium and the flip to that charge, okay, that positive charge. So what's that going to do? Like what's the next step then when those sodium gates open and it stimulates skeletal muscle? Really the next step is that the electrical signal is going to be sent down the uh, T-tubule, so we'll say action potentials are sent down what they call the T-tubule. The job of the T-tubule, which is simply uh, an important and unique structure inside the skeletal muscle cell or muscle fiber, which is the same thing. The T tubule's job is to send the action potentials out. So that, in a sense, is stimulating electrically all of the uh, T tubules and therefore all of the skeletal muscle fibers. So all of the skeletal muscle fibers are being electrically basically stimulated. What's going to be the next step is that then we will get a release of a very important mineral, calcium. We're going to get a release of calcium by terminal cistern. Terminal cistern. So one of the unique things about skeletal muscle is it is it, it, it has cells just like any other cells in our body, but they're a bit unique. It's a specialized tissue. If we go back to, to, to some of the tissues that we might have studied, uh, in some of our previous chapters, skeletal muscle is its own tissue type. What makes it so unique is that it can be stimulated, right? And of course, it fires. It fires and contracts. So that's what makes it really unique. One of the things that's unique on the inside is that skeletal muscle contains an organelle uh, called the sarcoplasm reticulum, which is simply a type of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. But what it does is it stores calcium, okay? Other cells in our body, uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulums do other functions, have other functions like detoxification. But in the skeletal muscle cell, it holds calcium. So when this firing process occurs, and we're going step by step here, sodium gates open, action potentials are sent through the T-tubules to all of the muscle fibers, and the next step is we get release of calcium from these terminal cisternae. The terminal cisternae are basically the ends of the sarcoplasm reticulum. They're just the ends of it. So essentially, the sarcoplasm reticulum is releasing the calcium by way of the terminal cisternae. Now that step is important because calcium is going to do something very crucial. It's going to trigger contraction. 
okay? Calcium is needed to trigger contractions. We're gonna try to um, draw this out a little bit here. So the next step, maybe I can just draw this right here, is that we have a molecule, and I'm gonna write it right here, called actin, and many of you know that actin is one of our myofilaments. Actin is considered one of the contractile myofilaments along with myosin, right? Those are the two that are gonna bind to trigger contraction, okay? Well, what's gonna happen is actin has two other molecules on it. It has a tropomyosin, okay? And it has another molecule, and I know I'm not probably drawing this the best here, but it has another molecule. I'm just gonna kind of draw like this, and it's called troponin, okay? Troponin and tropomyosin are considered regulatory proteins. They are both on the actin molecule, okay? So consider these, th or these two part of the actin molecule. So what's gonna happen is once calcium is released, Calcium is going to float over, picture it doing this, it's going to bind to the troponin, okay, the troponin molecule. So calcium binds to troponin, what does that do? That in turn is going to cause a shift in tropomyosin. So we'll put that it shifts. Tropomycin literally shifts out of the way. What is it doing specifically? It's moving off the active sites of actin. That's what like the textbook definition of it is. It's literally shifting out of the way. What it's doing is it is blocking actin from literally being able to contact the myosin. So actin and myosin are sitting right next to each other but they can't contact each other to trigger a contraction. Why? Because tropomyosin is blocking the active sites of actin. So when calcium binds to troponin, that triggers the movement after that of tropomyosin. It will literally shift and move out of the way, which means the next step is that actin myosin cross bridge, okay? which means, and we can just keep this simple, kind of simplify this really easily, is that we get a, we'll just put it this way, active myosin cross bridge, which is a fancy way of saying that active myosin are now contacting each other, connected to each other, and that's basically going to trigger or equal a contraction. Okay, so the one thing that directly triggers a contraction is basically, if you see it, is gonna be calcium binding to troponin. That triggers the cascade. Now obviously there's multiple other things that occur before calcium's released, but calcium is the big trigger here, right? That is our contraction process. A Couple of things we need to mention about that for a minute. One thing is that myosin you picture myosin, it is considered our thick filament. So I could draw it a little thicker here. You know, myosin and actin are right next to each other. Actin is the thinner filament. Uh, myosin is the thicker filament. They are gonna contact each other. And what happens during a contraction is, picture actin and myosin are sitting, you know, uh, next to each other and, and they're staggered. And what's gonna happen is during a contraction, they are gonna slide closer together. One of the key concepts with muscle contraction is that actin and myosin do not change lengths. Okay, the actual lengths of these myofilaments stay the same. So what happens is kind of like, I don't know, maybe like an accordion, uh, that might not be the best example, but what's gonna happen is the actin and myosin filaments are simply gonna contact each other so picture my fingers are touching each other and they are gonna slide closer together. That would be the contraction of the muscle and you would see a visibly shorten, shortening to the muscle. The entire muscle is going to visibly shorten, okay? What's not gonna shorten though is the actinomycin filaments, okay? Again, when the muscle relaxes, what's gonna happen? 
the actinomycin are going to slide further apart from each other. Okay, so that's what's going to happen when the muscle relaxes. And when the muscle relaxes, you can visibly see a lengthening of the muscle. Okay, so like we've talked before, we've talked about origin and insertion. Those two points will move closer together when the muscle contracts and move further apart when they relax. So keep that in mind. So that's one of the key concepts, okay, with uh, muscle physiology and contraction is that actinomycin filaments do not change lengths ever, okay? Keep that in mind. Now, they are in these regions we call sarcomeres, which spans from Z disc to Z disc. The Z disc, the Z discs will move closer together and the sarcomere will shorten, but the uh, actinomycin will not. Okay, so keep that in mind. Another thing we'll mention too is, and this is just kind of like a little side note, but calcium, um, one of the unique things is when a person dies, all their cells start to die instantaneously. One of the things that's released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum is calcium, and, and it gets released because the muscle cells die. Uh, but it's kind of, you know, they're in a dying process. So when the calcium is released, uh, many of you know this, uh, it's going to spontaneously be released when, when, when the person dies, right, from the, from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's going to spontaneously trigger muscle contraction because it's going to bind to troponin, move tropomycin out of the way, trigger contraction, okay? So what do we call that? You guys are familiar with rigor mortis. So that's rigor mortis the spontaneous contraction that we get in all of our skeletal muscles. Now that does not occur forever. That occurs for about, up to about 48 to maybe very extreme 60 hours after death. Okay, but it's because of the spontaneous release of calcium. So it shows how calcium is the ultimate trigger of contraction right before, uh, right beforehand. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, if traction occurs, then really all we have left, if you think about it, um, and I might not try to draw, draw all this out again, but really what you would have after that is just the, the reversal, right? The nerve signal is now going to stop because your brain's like, okay, you've contracted the muscle, let's stop now. So the nerve signal is going to cease. Um, acetylcholine then will not be released anymore. We also have an enzyme in the uh, synaptic cleft called acetylcholinesterase, which is going to help degrade any excess acetylcholine that helps stop right, the contraction process quicker. Um, and basically, everything's going to go in reverse. Calcium is going to quit being released. right? It's going to go back for storage in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And basically, everything's going to go back to normal. So that's basically the reversal of the contraction process, okay? You know, I shortened it a little bit, but that kind of gives you a step-by-step -step view of what's happening during the skeletal muscle contraction process. It is a lengthy process. Uh, but that's really the big steps that you want to know. If you want to know more details on any one thing, uh, feel free to ask me a question in the comments. Um, of course, there's more details on each one of these steps that you can dive deeper into, but it's meant to just show you the big picture. So as always, good luck and good study.